I've been reviewing The Walking Dead for what feels like an eternity, and I need a palate cleanser. So I picked another show about a zombie apocalypse, but this time it's different because the zombies are also mushrooms. <laughs> Just like The Walking Dead, this first season has been pretty good, and I hope my recap of every episode will encourage you to watch it for yourself. Apparently, you don't need to have played the games to understand the show, which is good for me because I haven't played the games. Well, at least now I can finally say that I know the story. And here it is, a recap of all nine episodes, neatly packed into a YouTube video for your viewing pleasure. Our story begins in the late 60s, where two professors of something are theorising that if a new strand of fungus mutated to survive a human host, we would most likely be unable to stop it from becoming a pandemic that will quickly end the human race. The host of this show is likely mocking the idea, with the audience awkwardly laughing along, because normal everyday people prefer to be ignorant. We take comfort in our lives by ignoring harsh truths. But oh boy, looks like we should have listened. We didn't listen! We, we didn't listen! Skip forward to 2003, and the world seems bright and cheery. Today is Joel's birthday, and his daughter Sarah wants to make him a special breakfast. But because Joel doesn't care about his birthday, he forgot to pick up the pancake stuff. And the same goes for his birthday cake. A seemingly insignificant detail, but it helps to show that he doesn't really value himself that much. And from the conversation he has with his brother, it's clear that he works too much and doesn't make much time for his family, even though he obviously loves them. Ah. And as they drive away, we see a bumper sticker informing us that he's a combat veteran. I like this kind of non-verbal exposition. And this next bit does that too. While Sarah's trying to concentrate on her schoolwork, a distracting light is reflecting on her paper from this student's twitching hand. So we now know one of the symptoms of infection. <coughs> After school, Sarah visits her elderly neighbour, because that's what nice neighbours do, I guess. And while she's distracted looking at some DVDs on a shelf, the wheelchair-bound lady in the background starts gurning out. But naturally, she stops by the time Sarah looks at her again. The dog knows something is up though, because for some reason dogs always know these kind of things. That night, Sarah gives Daddy his birthday present, which is his favourite watch that she got repaired for him. Did you? What? I don't hear anything. <laughs> the banter between these two feels really natural, and their dynamic feels totally genuine. Don't fall asleep. Of course I won't. It's too riveting. Later on, Joel gets a call from Tommy to come bail him out from jail, so he takes Sarah upstairs to sleep while he pops out. She awakes abruptly to the sound of helicopters flying over the house, and gets a little panicky seeing Dad isn't home. The neighbour's dog comes knocking and says, Yo, don't go in my house, shit is going down in there. She ignores the dog and walks in anyway, finding the old man is dying in the kitchen, one old woman is dead, and the older wheelchair-bound woman is no longer bound to her chair, and was just snacking on some human flesh and some ramen noodles. Joel arrives back home just in time to handle the situation with a trusty old wrench. What are we doing, Joel? <laughs> they get the hell out of there, desperately looking for a clear route out. But as is always the case in these scenarios, every road is blocked. They get diverted to going through a nearby town, and the chaos is stunning to look at. Check out this plane crashing and tell me it's not the coolest thing you've ever seen on TV. They manage to survive, but get separated from Tommy when a police car crashes into their already crashed car. While being chased by a zombie, a soldier takes it down, and continues to stay on alert in case Joel or Sarah are infected. He then gets a call on the radio where he's commanded to take them out regardless. We are not sick! And when the soldier comes to finish him off, Tommy arrives in time to save them. Oh, okay. Well, at least he saved Joel. We jump ahead 20 years and we see this lone kid wandering into the city of Boston, collapsing just before he gets to the gates. The guards take her to sickbay and run a scan, confirming that she's infected, but the kind-hearted lady guard chooses not to tell her and says that everything's okay and that she's safe now. And then we'll get you some new clothes and toys, as many as you want to play with. You're safe. <laughs> Two things I've got to point out before we move on. One, I don't know how my mouse cursor got recorded in this part of the footage. <laughs> and I sure hope it isn't there for the rest of the episode because that means I have to re-record. God damn it. And two, why didn't they just scan her outside the gates? Wouldn't that have been safer? 
Joel was temporarily tasked with chucking the bodies in the fire, and his non-reaction to the situation suggests that this isn't the first kid he's had to barbecue. This gated community is controlled by a military initiative called the Federal Disaster Response Agency, or FEDRA for short, and they have very strict rules and curfews in place to keep everyone safe, or so they say. People who rebel against FEDRA are given a public hanging to set an example, but this isn't enough to deter people from being a bit naughty. Take Joel for example, he set up a system where he trades the guards some drugs for food tokens. Or I could just shoot you. Yeah, but then what would you do? You're short five. Also involved in some shady dealings is his girlfriend Tess, who's in a tense negotiation conversation with the people who ripped her off when she bought a car battery from them. And as the discussion comes to a close, the building suddenly goes boom, leaving Tess dazed and confused. Outside, she ducks for cover as some rebels are making a stand against Fedra, and as she's arrested, she pleads her case that she's not a firefly, which is the name the rebels have labelled themselves with. We then cut to this character, who's chained up to a radiator. Game of Thrones fans will recognise her as Lyanna Mormont, the strong-willed and outspoken young girl. You were named for my Aunt Lyanna. Who said she was a great beauty, I'm sure you will be too. I doubt it. My mother wasn't a great beauty, or any other kind of beauty. She was a great warrior, though. And here too, the actor Bella Ramsey plays a girl with a similar attitude called Ellie. Hey, people are gonna come looking for me. People from Fedra, you hear me? Let me out or you're gonna pay, motherfuckers! Ellie's being held prisoner by the Fireflies for some reason, and being tested on the daily to see if she's of sound mind and not turning into a mushroom zombie. Only the leader of the Fireflies, Marlene, knows why she's being held here, and before she rolls out her plan, she tells only her most trusted soldier. She then visits Ellie and tells her that she's known her since she was born, and that she was the one who sent her to military school to protect her. And now Ellie's about to find out why she's so special to need to be kept here for a while. Why won't you let me go? Because you have a greater purpose than any of us could have ever imagined. Joel and Tess hunt down the person who took the car battery from that deal earlier, and they find out that Marlene was going to use it to transport Ellie to another Firefly camp. But now that Marlene is too wounded to travel, she sets up another deal with Joel and Tess, saying that if they can take her to the other Firefly camp, they will be rewarded with a functioning car. But why do they need a car? Well, earlier we saw Joel bartering for the location of the radio tower that Tommy last sent a message from. But as Joel hasn't heard back from him in a few weeks, he wants to go there to make sure he's okay. Ellie doesn't want to go with Joel, as he's an unknown middle-aged man with a moustache. And Joel doesn't want to travel with her because she's kind of a brat. As they sneak out of town, they're spotted by the guard that Joel sometimes does shady deals with. Instead of letting them go, he decides to do his job, testing them for infection since they're outside the walls. Ellie starts to panic as he begins scanning, and as he scans Ellie, she stabs him in the leg. Joel then tackles him to the ground and begins whacking him off. You know, as in whacking him in the face until he's no longer conscious. They share a look to say WTF, and then we get this moment. Joel! I'm not sick! Joel! I'm not sick! So, with the reveal that Ellie is infected, they have two options. Run and continue with their mission with the possibility that Ellie will turn into a mushroom zombie, or they can go back inside and all be at risk of being strung up publicly for breaking the rules. The first option sounds more fun, so they go with it and run off into the big city for a new adventure. The episode starts with a flashback to before the infection spread, and we see this seemingly ordinary woman trying to enjoy some lunch, but then the military are all up in her business saying, hey, you're not under arrest, but you have to come with us. And you're no ordinary woman, you're a professor of mycology, which essentially means a fungus fanatic. They ask her to study a fungus sample, and she says there's no way this sample came from a human. So they show her proof in a recently deceased corpse. When she pulls out a piece confirming the impossible, she nopes out of there. This next part, where a military general is asking how to combat the spread of the deadly fungus, she grimly declares that there is no stopping it, not unless you bomb this entire city with everyone in it, and the bombing must start immediately. Bomb seluruh kota, dan seluruh orang yang ada di dalamnya. I absolutely loved this opening. She really made you feel the dread of their situation. 
Ellie wakes up to see that she's been watched carefully to ensure she doesn't turn. And when she doesn't turn and they feel safe to approach, Tess demands to know why she's so special that she gets chicken sandwiches for lunch, while she and Joel have to eat boring old beef jerky. And also, why should they risk their lives taking her to the Fireflies? With doctors. They're working on a cure. Mm -hmm. I've heard this before. And whatever happened to me is it's the, the key, key to, to finding find the vaccine. That's what this is. We've heard this a million times. Vaccines, miracle cures. None of it works ever. Fuck you, man. I didn't ask for this. You and me both. This isn't going to end well, Tess. It doesn't matter if she is or she isn't what the Fireflies say. If they believe that she is, then we get what we want. Ellie asks for a gun so she can defend herself. Can I have a gun? Absolutely no. not. Okay, Jesus, fine. I'll just throw a fucking sandwich at them. Man, she is funny as hell. They walk through the city, which looks amazing by the way. In my opinion, much more creativity was applied here than they did for The Walking Dead. As they traipse through the city, we hear how sheltered Ellie has been from dealing with the infected, as she's been raised behind walls her whole life. But the tough exterior presented in her personality leads you to believe that she's no pushover. The episode does great in showing you the complexity of having such a character to look after. Take this scene for example. She's being sarcastic. I don't I know how to swim. Seriously? Do you think we have pools in the QC? No, smart ass. I mean... And then she starts goofing around like a kid, because she is a kid. Ding, ding. Yes, sir, I would like your finest suite, please. Yes, ma'am, would you like me to take your luggage? Before being scared and feeling vulnerable. Uh, I'm sorry. I like this small funny detail where a frog is playing the piano, instead of adding music to the scene in post-production. They look out from a building and see a cluster of the mushroom zombies all flailing around in sync as they rest on the floor. A cool way to show us that they all work like a hive mind, with their information being shared by connecting roots in the floor. So if you step on one of these fungal roots a mile away, it would alert all the connecting zombies to your location. As Tess explains all of this, she does wear well when reminding Ellie that just because she has immunity to infection, she can still be ripped in two by these things. The next part of their route involves having to go through a museum, which is covered in this old, dried up mushroom splooge. It's bone dry. Joel says that all of the zombies in this building must be dead, but no one watching this believes you, Joel. The journey up the stairs was genuinely creepy, loving this set design and how every footstep looks like potential danger. They encounter these blind mushroom zombies called clickers that sort of tweak about and make horrible noises. Ellie takes a panicked breath a bit too loud. Thankfully, these zombies stick to zombie lore by dying if they get shot in the head. After surviving this encounter, Tess is very keen to finish their journey before dark. They arrive at the trade point, but no one is there. But there is a suspicious trail of blood leading into this nearby building. Inside, there are no survivors, and Tess despairs at the idea of this trip being a waste of time. Jar urges her to stop searching for clues and go home. It's over. We are going home. This is not my fucking home! Her emotional outburst here reveals that she was bitten, which explains why she was so determined to not have wasted their time in this opportunity to find a cure. Tess says there's still a chance of getting her to the next outpost if they use the help of two guys they know called Bill and Frank. But Joel isn't feeling confident about this idea. Halfway through their emotional dispute, one of the infected comes alive, so Joel shoots it back down. Unfortunately, this zombie guy lands on a pile of mushroom splooge, and Joel rushes out to hear the distant sound of zombies being triggered, meaning they have little time to get out of there. Tess gives them a head start by pouring gasoline and sprinkling grenades everywhere, ready to sacrifice herself when the time is right. As she attempts to get the lighter struck, we get this gross visual of fungi sprouting into her mouth from the zombie's mouth. I like seeing how differently they handle Tess's death, with Joel being so used to seeing people he cares about dying that he just swallows his emotions, whereas Ellie, who was forming a fondness for her, tears up. Joel keeps his distance from Ellie, both physically and emotionally, and Ellie's tired of him blanking her since Tess died. Nobody made you or Tess take me. Nobody made you go along with this plan. You needed a truck battery or whatever, and you made a choice. So don't blame me for something that isn't my fault. 
damn, that's a good line of dialogue. They make up a bit by sharing stories along the road. And Ellie once again asks for a gun, but Joel still says no. You know, seeing as it's just the two of us, I was thinking I should no. There's so many funny bits of banter between the two that really hook you into their developing relationship. Nice knife. Where'd you learn to do that? The circus. And instead of me repeating this point too often, from time to time, I'm just going to throw in clips like this. Dashed? Why do you have stuff stashed here? You asked a lot of goddamn questions. Yes, I do. They stop at this place where Joel has stashed some stuff, and Ellie's excited to see a Mortal Kombat machine because she enjoys blood. And then she gets excited to find tampons because sometimes she doesn't enjoy blood. I've never seen feminine hygiene products being presented as a resource need in a zombie apocalypse show, so that was a cool detail. Later, as Ellie and Joel look over some spooky skeletons, it transitions to when the skeletons used to be inside people, and these people are being evacuated from their hometown. Determined to stick around is this guy, who's hidden himself away watching the evacuation on CCTV. Not today, you new world order jackboot fucks. When he sees he has the town to himself, he begins collecting supplies in a montage that's both fun to watch and interesting to see how proficient he is in self-sustainment. Blah. Self-sustainment. This is basically what doomsday preppers dream of. And I admittedly had a phase in my early 20s where this doomsday prepper lifestyle interested me. But I was too lazy to put in the work for a scenario that will probably never happen in my lifetime. This guy's name is Bill, and while Bill is eating a delicious looking dinner, one of his alerts goes off to say something fell in his trap. When he inspects what fell in, he finds a guy in there who says he's heading Boston way. His name is Frank. Frank politely requests for some food before he continues on his journey, and eventually Bill says okay. He also allows him to have a long shower and gives him some fresh clothes to change into. When it's dinner time, he doesn't just sling a tin of beans at him and tell him to piss off. He cooks him one of his delicious meals. Mm. What the fuck? Everything tastes good when you're starving. Yeah, but not like this. Frank seems a little bit too comfortable here by asking if he can play his piano, but he chooses a song that hits Bill in his emotional weak spot, so Bill takes over to play something else. I want some crusher. A little crusher. When Frank asks who was the lucky girl that he used to play that to, and then Bill says there was no girl, Frank's gaydar goes nuts because he knows he's hit the jackpot. What follows is a long segment of the episode dedicated to showing their love develop over time, to the point where they become your standard bickering married couple. I live in this world, you live in a psycho bunker where 9-11 was an inside job and, and the government are all Nazis. The government are all Nazis! For as good as this storyline was, however, I was more invested in getting back to Ellie and Joel's story. To have an episode like this so early on felt a bit jarring. This is the kind of story I'd expect to see later in the season, when we would benefit from a change up to learn about some other characters. But this being the third episode, I didn't feel ready yet. Still, I did enjoy their storyline. The acting was amazing from both guys, and about halfway through we get to see how this couple met Joel and Tess, because Frank broke Bill's rules by communicating with others through the radio. We will never have friends, because there are no friends to be had. I've actually been talking to a nice woman on the radio. You what?! It's at this meeting where Frank shares his enthusiasm to trade with Tess, whereas Bill remains guarded to the idea of being friends with these strangers. We then see the rest of their lives play out, doing nice activities with each other like gardening, and then doing not so nice activities like treating bullet wounds, because they just fended off some raiders. And then the end of their story is them taking their own lives by swallowing a load of pills with their dinner. Frank was suffering with cancer, and Bill couldn't live without him. It was a bittersweet moment. Fast forward into the present, Joel and Ellie find the letter that Bill left him, explaining that they're no longer around, so feel free to take their stuff before you go. Before they set off, Ellie finds a gun and stashes it in her backpack before Joel sees it. And that's the end of this high quality episode, that I would have rated a bit higher had it been later in the series, but maybe canonically it had to be around here to follow the game story. But as previously stated, I haven't played the game, so this is all I have to go off. While Joel is demonstrating how to siphon gas, he tells Ellie not to wander off. So out of boredom, she starts reading puns from a book. What did the mermaid wear to her math class? An algebra. Like, an algebra. Joel isn't ready for laughing yet, but keep persevering, Ellie. You'll get him to crack a smile soon enough. 
Their next hopeful destination is the place where Joel thinks his brother will be. And on the road, they share some funny back and forth when Ellie finds this raunchy magazine. Why are all these pages stuck together? Uh. I'm just fucking with you. When night time arrives, they camp out and eat some Chef Boyardee, which I've always wanted to try, but never had the privilege as a British geezer. One thing I don't understand, though, is why they've chosen to sleep on the floor when they could be sleeping inside the truck. Would be safer, right? I love that the next morning Ellie grimaces at the idea of coffee, and then continues to insult coffee as they drive along. It smells like burnt shit. It's hard not to agree with her here, even though I do love coffee. They're making their way through Kansas City when some guys attempt to trick them into stopping, with their failsafe being tire spikes that bring them to a crashing halt. Joel tells Ellie to get to cover while he deals with these side characters. And just as he thinks his job well done, a younger guy catches him by surprise and almost chokes him out. Ellie senses that now is the time to use that gun she stashed. No, 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 it's okay. It's okay. It's over. We're not fighting anymore. trade with you guys. We can be friends. I didn't know. I'm Brian. I'm Brian. What's your name? I like how we're made to sympathize with this young Brian lad, who's clearly just a kid who's out of his depth trying to be a radar or whatever. So much so that you kind of view Joel as a dick for how he responds to this situation. Please! Please! I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Please! We see the leader of Brian's group interrogating some guy, looking to find the people that report to Fedra about her rebellion group. That's the gist of it, I believe. Honestly, this part doesn't really resonate with me. And as villains go, she's not intimidating one bit. She looks and sounds like her average school teacher. Did it feel good? Betraying your neighbors to Fedra? How does it make you feel now? The main takeaway from this is that she's looking for one informant more than the others, a guy called Henry. Back to Ellie and Joel, they're hiding out until the coast is clear, and Joel acknowledges that seeing people shot and killed might be a new experience for her, and that's a lot to deal with as a kid. But when she confesses that it wasn't her first time shooting someone, Joel decides that now is the time to officially hand her a gun, and more importantly, teach her how to use it. They find a building to camp out in overnight, and Ellie tries once again to get him to lighten up with a classic pun. Did you know diarrhea is hereditary? What? Yeah. It runs in your jeans. <laughs> that is so goddamn stupid. <laughs> you laughed, motherfucker. I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. That's a nice moment. What isn't nice, though, is waking up to a gun in your face. Also, earlier, school teacher Sally and her guard find a cluster of mushroom zombies trying to break through this floor. So that's two things we're going to have to deal with in the next episode. In this flashback, we see Henry and his deaf brother on the run from school teacher Sally. They're hiding out in this loft, desperately hoping to escape town soon when the opportunity arises, with their dwindling food supplies adding a level of urgency. On their way out, they stumble into Joe and Ellie, and while holding them at gunpoint, Ellie sees the fear and unwillingness to cause harm in Henry's eyes, while Joel treats them like any other would-be sticker-upper. But if I lower my gun, we didn't hurt you, so you don't hurt us, right? That's right. That's a weird fucking tone, man. That's just the way he sounds. He has an asshole voice. Joe, tell him he's okay. Everything is great. Dude. Henry explains that Fedra drove all of the infected underground, and he expects that they're all dead by now based on some info he received. Yeah, might want to check your sources, bro. But just in case he's wrong, which he is, he says they can work together to escape, as Henry knows the rebel scouting route and timetable. Surprisingly, they don't bump into any of the infected in the underground routes. I guess they're all gathered together in clusters, ready to pop like a zit. This band of new friends get more acquainted, Ellie bonding with Sam over comics, and Joel and Henry bonding over how guilty they should feel about their murders. It's a nice moment of bonding, but not all that interesting. What is interesting, though, is when they get to the edge of the city and some guy starts sniping at them and missing horribly. Joel takes him out, but it's too late, as he's already called for backup and they're steamrolling their way in right now. And then Joel hits a tasty sniper shot to stop Ellie being turned into mush. 
This next part is a TV and movie trope I've never understood, where the bad guy is calling for the good guy to come out of hiding, but it's obvious where they're hiding because there's only about two places they could be. And when the good guy calls out, it's obvious he's nearby. I'll come out. Just let the kids go. No. Sorry. Meanwhile, you look at the bad guy with a whole gang of people at their disposal, and they're just standing there instead of checking the two hiding places. You could have found him in less than a minute. Henry comes out of hiding, and just as he's about to be eliminated by school teacher Sally, a cluster of mushroom zombies burst out from the ground. And then we get this surprise new mushroom zombie variant, who's been hitting the gym real hard. I really don't understand how this kind of mushroom zombie can exist, as I was under the impression the fungus just takes over human bodies, and I don't have the ability to transform them into massive monsters. Well, however this thing came to be, it's eating bullets like Tic Tacs, and it proceeds to rip this guy's head clean off. School teacher Sally gets jumped by a smaller mushroom zombie, and everyone else appears to get away safely. But hang on a minute, The Last of Us is a zombie show, and in zombie shows, someone always gets bit. Ah, there we go. The deaf kid knows his time is short, and so he has one last question on his mind. Oh, isn't he sweet? But also, he wants to know if he retains the person he is when he turns. Uh, the answer's no, you dumb, dumb idiot. Because you wouldn't run around biting people, would you, you stupid idiot? Ellie takes the kinder approach by convincing him that her immune blood, when fused with his, will prevent him from turning. I'm not sure that she's 100% convinced of this, and is simply just trying to comfort him. She promises to not fall asleep, but does, and wakes up to find that he's turned. <laughs> Henry, overcome with guilt, can't live without his bro, and so he takes the easy way out. At the start of the episode, we meet this cabin dwelling couple, and it's revealed that Joel was waiting for the husband to come back home to demand his help. Hilariously and very charmingly, the wife was immediately accommodating to Joel. Why didn't you shoot him? The gun's all the way over there. He didn't hurt me, by the way. Yeah, I got eyes. You made him soup? Yeah, I did. It's cold out. They feel like such an authentic couple that I actually felt sad when I learned they aren't a couple in real life. I need you to tell us where we are. If you got a map, why are you lost? You must have missed all the street signs in the enormous fucking forest. Holy. <laughs> Joel isn't here to hurt anyone. He just needs direction so he can keep heading west. But the couple tells him that no one survives that side of the river. Hearing this grim news triggers Joel's PTSD, which he plays off as the cold air hitting his lungs. <laughs> They spend a day or so walking, talking, and bonding while looking at northern lights, and then they get surrounded by some red dead cosplayers, who send in their sniffer dog that can apparently detect infection. <laughs> Your dog is broken, sir. One of the ladies gives Joel a stare of familiarity when he says he's looking for his brother, and so with this familiarity, they get escorted back to the town. Tommy! <laughs> While Joel was scraping by living under Fedra's harsh rules, Tommy's been living in a new age paradise, it seems. Although he doesn't like the idea of this community-led society being called communism. Everything you see in our town, greenhouses, livestock, all shared. Collective ownership. So, uh, communism. Nah, nah, I didn't like that. It is that, literally. This is the commune. We're communists. No way. That's a nice bit of exposition to Tommy and Joel's joint feelings on politics. While Tommy's wife shows Ellie some horses, Joel and Tommy catch up in the town's bar. Thanks for still giving a shit about me. Working on raising some hogs, too. Once we get bacon, I mean, what's even left? It starts off pleasant, but then Joel makes the assumption that Tommy would want to come with them to complete the mission. But Tommy reveals that he's going to be a dad, and says that the responsible thing for him to do would be to stay here, and continue to be a productive member of this community. Joel naturally feels a bit betrayed by this. Just because life stopped for you, doesn't mean it has to stop for me. Tommy visits him later on to try and reconnect, and it's at this point where Joel reveals his feelings of inadequacy to keep Ellie safe. 
Well, well, I don't know. He's done pretty great so far. He reveals the information that Ellie has the fungus, but she's immune to it, and asks Tommy to reconsider taking her now that he knows a cure is the end game of this mission. So he says, okay, fine. I guess saving the world would be neat. Ellie doesn't take this news well, so Joel tries to convince her that he doesn't care about her that deeply, just to make this separation easier. You're not my daughter. I'm not sure as hell ain't your dad. Now come down. We're going our separate ways. By morning time, he's had a chance to sleep on it and decides that she's mature enough to make her own choices. You deserve a choice. I still think you'd be better off with Tommy. Let's go. Okay. I love that moment. Her trust and connection with Joel supersedes the fact that Tommy would be the better choice. They arrive at the Firefly camp, but it seems no one's home, aside from these monkeys. <laughs> Look at them go. First time seeing a monkey? First time seeing a monkey. As they explore the building looking for clues and where to search next, they spot some raiders wandering around outside. They attempt to sneak back to the halls, but get spotted. <laughs> After Joel takes the guy out, he realises he got shanked with the broken bat, and so they ride off in a hurry to find a place to recover. Joel's body gives out before they find a suitable place, but his willingness to live keeps him breathing, while Ellie despairs at their situation. Joel, open your eyes. Open your eyes. Joel, you gotta get up. Joel. This episode has the lowest rating on IMDb, but personally, I really enjoyed this one. Although my opinion is swayed by the appeal of it being a zombie apocalypse where you get to hang out in an abandoned shopping mall, a common setting in the zombie genre that I enjoy conceptually and aesthetically. Before we get to that part, we should check in on Joel. For a hospital bed, Joel is having to make do with a dirty old mattress, while Nurse Ellie does her best to aid him while having no medical training and also being a kid. Hell, I'm a grown man and I'd have no idea what to do here. Joel tells her to leave him behind, but she's too much of a good friend to do that. Thinking about her friendships, the story goes back in time to when she was in military school. She gets in a fight and then her superior tells her, you're too smart and too strong to be doing this kind of stuff, blah, blah, blah. The standard dialogue for this type of scenario. Skipping to the more interesting parts where her friend Riley sneaks back into the academy. She tells Ellie that she joined the Fireflies, which is a massive traitor move. Talking about liberating the QC is not the same as... Where did you even- Slow down, slow down, I will tell you everything. Riley says, come with me and I'll give you the night of your life. And because they're super best friends and also gay for each other, like that wasn't obvious, Ellie agrees to sneak out with her. They come across this guy who overdosed on booze and pills, so they take the booze to enhance their good times. <laughs> Riley says she has a series of surprises for her, and the first one is Ellie's first visit to a shopping mall. Then Ellie experiences some more things for the first time, like escalators, a carousel, a photo booth, and my favourite part, the arcade. And this is where we discover the root of Ellie's fascination with Mortal Kombat. Oh wait, how do I play? Smash the buttons. There's so many of them. Finish him. Finish him! Do not finish me. But then you wouldn't get to see this. Oh, fuck. All the while, they keep exchanging awkward flirtatious looks, with Ellie being too shy to make a move and Riley not acknowledging the obvious attraction. Ominously, we pan away from the arcades to a shop where a mushroom zombie awakes, hearing the jingles and commotion of the arcade. Of course, the show builds up tension by not having it appear right away, and the whole time while these two are talking, you're wondering when it's going to jump out. Ellie finds some bombs that Riley was guarding, and it becomes clear that Riley isn't just hanging around here for fun. She's been stationed here by the Fireflies, which makes Ellie feel like she wasn't being honest with her. We would never use them on you or anywhere ever near you. I would never let them do that. You would never let them? Right, and you think they're going to listen to you? As Ellie storms out, Riley reveals that she's leaving soon, as she's about to be reassigned to another post far away. And doing all of this for Ellie was like a goodbye present. Why did you bring me here? Because I wanted to see you. And I wanted to say goodbye. This isn't easy, Ellie. It actually is. You just did it. 
Ellie's even more upset now and heads for the door, but then stops because she realises that Riley was being a good person. On her way back to make amends, she hears screaming and so she starts running, only to find that the screaming was his Halloween decoration triggered by Riley. They make up and goof around for a bit, and Ellie sweetly begs her to run away from her duties. Okay. <sighs> this loving moment is interrupted by the mushroom zombie who finally makes an appearance. Mushroom Zombie relentlessly attacks the girls in a fight scene that felt real, where these two both succeed but they've been bitten. They weigh up their options for going out on their own terms or waiting for the fungus to take over their brains. Either way, they know this is the end of their relationship, about 30 minutes after it began. As the episode closes, we don't get to find out what option they took, as it cuts back to Ellie, who now feels a rush of urgency to stop another friend from dying. She finds a needle and thread and hurriedly stitches Joel's wound. The episode opens with some new faces, although we only need to focus on the main guy who's speaking to his group. He appears to be a man of faith who's reading bible stories to inspire hope in this group, who all look like total crap. Joel's wound is now infected, so Ellie leaves in the desperate hope of finding some supplies. She comes across a deer, which means that she might be able to at least bring back some food. But before she can claim her prize, the pastor and his subordinate find it first, and they look around to see who shot it. Joel! Drop your rifles! The pastor, whose name is David, explains that there's no way that she would be able to drag the deer back to her place, so the reasonable thing to do here is to offer a trade. David and his group get half the deer, and they'll give her some penicillin. While they wait for David's guy to get the stuff, they keep warm next to a fire, where David explains that after the apocalypse, he became a religious leader for this group. Before that, I was a teacher. Math. Taught kids about your age. So you went from teacher to preacher because what, it fucking rhymes? Yeah, exactly. When the guy comes back, Ellie refuses David's offer to become part of their group, which is for the best, as it turns out David is a psychopath. <laughs> oh, wow! Wow! This group doesn't really have a choice, it seems, as under David's leadership, they're still getting regular meals. But this meat doesn't look very kosher, does it? Hmm. Ellie injects the antibiotics so that Joel can start recovering, and just in time too, as Ellie spots David's group searching for her. Ellie rushes back to beg him to wake up, but when he doesn't respond, she barricades him in and hopes for the best while fleeing the scene, in an effort to draw them away. Ellie wakes up in a cage, and David tries convincing her to be a part of the group so that he's not forced to kill her. Ellie then spots an ear on the floor, and quickly surmises that they've been eating human flesh to stay alive. David then creepily tries seducing her to the idea of being a couple, so that they can run this place together and make it better. Ellie, using her brain, realises this creep will let his guard down if she reciprocates. Ah! 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 While Ellie awaits to see what her punishment is, back home, Joel manages to get up so he can pull a sneak attack on the guy searching the house. And then he manages to tie up two more guys so that he can extract information out of them. Ah, oh, the town! What town? Silver Lake. <laughs> Even though he gets the information he needs, he still kills them. It's okay. No. I believe him. No. God damn, Joel, settle down. Ellie bites David's hand as they pin her to the chopping block, and Ellie tells them not to eat her because she's infected, and so too is David now. With this alarming distraction, Ellie swings the butcher's knife into the other guy's neck and makes a run for it. David corners her into this restaurant, where Ellie sets to place a light trying to fend him off. At this point, David doesn't care about living or dying, and only wants to take advantage of Ellie in the worst possible way. Luckily, she manages to reach for a blade or something, and violently turns him into Swiss cheese. She runs out of the burning building and into the protective arms of Joel. It's okay, baby girl. <laughs> A pregnant woman is running through the forest and tries to barricade herself into a safe house as she was being chased by a mushroom zombie. I was delighted to find out that this is the actor who played Ellie in the games. 
She's giving birth at the worst possible time as the mushroom zombie crashes through the door and the struggle she puts up to survive is so intense that she gives birth halfway through. Hi. She welcomes Ellie to the world, but this is a bittersweet moment as her leg got bit, so she won't be there to watch her grow up. As she cut the umbilical cord straight away, it makes sense how Ellie has grown up immune. I mean, it makes sense in a fictional kind of way, possibly going against real life medical science, but who knows or cares. Marlene finds her and Ellie just in time for her to take Ellie away and protect her, and then she fulfills game Ellie's last wishes by putting a cap in her to stop her from turning. Back to present day, Ellie and Joel are heading towards a Firefly hospital. I must have missed the part where they made this plan, but that's where they're heading. Along the way, we get this picturesque moment where Ellie finds a giraffe poking its head into a building. It's a nice moment to remind us how much nature has reclaimed the earth back from humans. <laughs> hey there. They continue making their way downtown and they make a quick stop to get sentimental. Joel tells Ellie that he almost gave up on life when Sarah died and hints that the person who helps him find meaning again is Ellie. Reciprocating these feelings of connection, Ellie says I'm glad you didn't die. Then to spice things up a bit, they get attacked by some flash grenades. Joel wakes up to apologies from Marlene as the people who attacked them didn't know they were Ellie and Joel. We're sorry. He asks where Ellie is and Marlene informs him that she's being prepped for surgery. A surgery that will remove the cordyceps fungus from her brain, which will then be used in developing the cure. But it comes with the slight snag that this surgery will kill her. So while being escorted out of the building, Joel gets the better of the guards and goes on a mad shooting spree looking for Ellie. I'm not a fan of these shootouts where it feels like the main guy had too clean of an experience, where he doesn't get shot or have any close calls, but it's fine, we can move past it. He picks up an unconscious Ellie and makes it all the way to the underground car park where he gets stopped by Marlene. She urges him to consider the consequences of denying the world a cure to this infection. Joel sees that there's no way of keeping Marlene from chasing Ellie after he leaves, so he decides to shoot Marlene dead. You just come after her. Marlene did not deserve this. After everything she's done for Ellie, Joel is being super selfish here by denying Ellie the choice. But that's what I love about Joel's character. Despite being one of this story's protagonists, he's far from perfect, and it makes him feel like a real person that would exist in this world. When Ellie wakes up, he lies and says that the Fireflies found other people with the immunity. But then raiders attack the hospital, so he had to get her out of there. And so their journey continues on. I already know some of the story of The Last of Us Chapter 2, mainly from all of the YouTube videos where people are complaining about the game, but I'm still very excited to watch the second season when it comes out, and I'll definitely be making a video on it. Thank you to all of my Patreon supporters. For the first tier guys, you get credited here. And for the only guy who's currently on my top tier, he's classified as executive producer. It's worth pointing out that you can gain access to exclusive videos for just $1 a month. All you have to do is choose a custom contribution. That way you can still support me and not be tied into paying for the tiers. But if you do become a tiered member, you'll be credited at the end of each video. And I must say I've been blown away by the super thanks donations on my last video. And from here on, I'll be pinning in these super thanks comments like I'm parading you in the streets as a hero. No matter if you give or just enjoy watching my content for free, I appreciate you. And if you're new here, why not check out my Walking Dead coverage? Playlist will be shown here until season two of The Last of Us gets uploaded. 